Welcome to Crime Most French, a fortnightly podcast covering intriguing cases carried out on French soil. Researched and narrated by Cedric and rudely interrupted by me, Melanie. We're the true crime podcast on the lines. Crack open the van and let the mayhem commence. This is episode 52, Alain Lamar. In 1978, in the Oise department, north of Paris, that's where Charles de Gaulle's airport is, a serial killer is at work. It takes a year to the police and the gendarmerie to catch him, and he was hiding just under their nose. In May 1978, a gendarmerie patrol stumbles upon a Peugeot 504 hidden in the bushes in the Chantilly forest. There's a big forest. Mm-hmm. My parents had two, two of those 504s in the 80s. They were very, very common family cars. Quite big and boxy, no? Um, they were quite big. Boxy, yes, but they were all boxy at the time. <laughs> yeah, so all cars in the 70s and 80s were boxy. Yeah. Yeah. When they ran the plate, they discovered that it was a gendarme's wife's car that had been stolen not long before. She had left the keys on the ignition when she went shopping. Apparently the 70s were very different. She left her keys in the car. Yeah. Like, in, it actually in the... In the ignition, yeah. God. The car had two holes in the windscreen and a blood sta- a blood-stained handkerchief on the passenger seat and a thin rope near it. That's very weird. Yes. On the back seat, the gendarmes discover bullet casings, uh-huh. a document brief- brief- briefcase, right. and a ton of... Of gitan cigarette butts. So the gitans are the blue packet that gives you cancer. Well, are they cigarettes, are they? Gitan. Oh, yeah, they're the biggest brand in the 70s and 80s, oh, but right, no okay. filter, no nothing. They would just give you cancer the first time you have one. Oh, I, th- they were I, think nasty. Ga- I think everybody knows the Galois, but d- I've never heard oh, of Oh, yeah. The oh. Galois. Yeah, well, the Galois had a, a Galois helmet on it. Okay. They were blue as well, but the gitan had a, like a flamenco dancer on it. Oh, right, okay. The, Gitan was bigger than Goulois at the time. I see. But they were nasty. Give me nice the... brown teeth. And, uh, oh yeah, brown and brown fingers. fingers. Yeah, yeah, because no filter. <laughs> nice. Outside the car, they find a syringe and a map that hints at the fact that that car had, had been around the holdup. Right. The inquiry goes to the gendarme in Saint-Maxence. Just a town. Yeah, yeah. But not much comes out of it. They believe that the car was involved in some big gangster heist. Today, the, the cops would have a field day because there was evidence everywhere. Yeah. There were fingerprints, DNA, the map, writing on the map. There was tons of things. But of course, it's the 70s. So forensics are there, but eh, not great. But it's kind of weird that it was a cop's car, no? It's a cop's wife's car. But yeah. it, it had been, what, stolen? Stolen, yeah. Okay. But she left the keys inside, so... Yes, that's right, yeah. God, how short my I'm like a goldfish. <laughs> oh, yes, I forgot about that. Two months later, at Pont Saint-Maxence, so not far... Yeah. Karine, who's 17, leaves the cinema at night and walks home alone. Again, it's the 70s. It's a different year. Mm. As she walks in the street, a red Renault 12... My parents had one of those in the 70s, uh, orange. Tell you what, your Doesn't parents had a lot of different cars. Uh, at the time, they didn't last very long. <laughs> um, comes to her level, and the driver shoots at her three times. Wow. And then takes off. That's crazy. It, it, it sounds completely crazy, because she's a 17-year-old girl. Yeah. And just the guy comes, shoots her, and goes away. She's injured on the left leg, but she's otherwise okay. Okay, so she'll make a full recovery. That's good. The car is identified. It's a farmer's car who had left the keys in the ignition when he went shopping. Oh, my God. People, it's like, it's 70s a, people of France, stop leaving your yeah. keys in your car. So this time it's the local police that is in charge of the inquiries, not right. the gendarmerie. So I'm taking it as we're, we're talking about guns and cars. These two cars are connected. At, at the time, they don't know. Um, there's no reason to think that they are. Mm-hmm. Ten days later, the gendarmes discover the red Renault 12 in Creil. It's easy to spot. All the cars in the streets are parked on the odd numbers side. Right. It's parked on the even number. 
Right. So it's so alone it's not... on the wrong side of the door, not the road. Yeah, they no, they must have had an alternating uh, side of the road for parking. Yeah. And of course, obviously, it was parked where the car mm. where cars were, and yeah, then they so... changed side, except it was abandoned. It was so it clearly not a local, and it had been yeah. abandoned. So it was very easy to spot. Right. He, the gendarme who discovers the car, goes to the car to check it out mm-hmm. because he doesn't know anything. All he knows is that that's a car that's clearly been abandoned. Yeah. So he's going to have a look. He has heard that a group of gendarmes is looking for a Renault 12, but at the time, every two second car was a Renault 12 anyway. So he opens the door and boom, a bomb explodes. It was booby trapped. This is now really seriously starting to sound like a film. So the gendarme is lucky. He has a few second degree burns and ringing ears, probably. Yeah. But otherwise, he's fine. Wow. This time, Mr. Craig Gendarmerie, who's in charge of the inquiry. So okay. third police force mm. for three cases. But it's there's no reason to think they're related yeah. at that point. But, but they're not going to be talking to each other. So probably no, not. no connections yet. In August, an anonymous letter is sent to the Cray police station. The letter explains that it will provide some information on a red Renault 12 whose red plate is described in the letter and it matches the booby trap one. Uh-huh. As proof, the papers of the car are in envelope, the uh-huh. categories. Right. The letter blames the cop for opening the car without being careful enough. <laughs> and he said they shouldn't have done that and should have been way more careful. It's his fault. Yeah, that's a uh, bullshit. Yeah. The letter also says a, s- a young 17-year-old girl that walks provo- provocatively in the street at night is a target I like. She, should have wo- she shouldn't have walked home alone. So basically, um, all these bad things that are happening is everyone else's fault. Yes. Yes. Uh-huh. I sense a pattern here. Yes. He also says that he has three mobile trapped cars. Great. And the letter ends with, I'm a killer and therefore I'm going to kill. Next time, I'll aim for the heart. So these were just warnings, were they? It doesn't sound like it was warnings. It, sound like, it sounded like it was him doing something and then realizing that it wasn't good enough. Mm. So he shot a girl in the street, but aimed for the legs. Right. And then he realized, yeah, but then she survived. That's not good. Next time, I'll aim for the heart. Right. That, that's, that's what it sounds like. So the police chief makes copies of the letter and sends it to some of his colleagues. One copy ends up in the hands of Daniel Neveu, who is a cop in the Cray police station. His nickname is Maigret, because <laughs> apparently he has very good intuition. Right. When he looks at the letter, he reads it properly. The others all put it in the bin because they don't care. He reads it, and he puts it on the floor in his office, and he also puts on the floor all... The, the current affairs that haven't been sold yet. Sold right. yet. So, so all, all he spreads open... all that paper on the floor and then he starts comparing. Okay, so he, he really should have put it on a, on a board. If this had been a film, it would have been on a board. Oh, and a red string, yes. Yeah, there would have been the string. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But mm-hmm. it's a small office probably in a, Pari- mm. in a near Paris police yeah. station, so he just spreads it on the floor. Uh-huh. As he compares the map found in the 504 in another affair... He recognizes the writing. It's the same writing, according to him, as the, in the letter. Okay, so that's how they make the connection. So that connects the Renault yeah. 12 to the 504. Mm-hmm. Reading the letter, the letter carefully, he's also totally certain that it's written by a gendarme. Right. Because the wording, the rhythm of the sentences, the expressions used, to him, they, they think of gendarme. Yeah. So he's himself a cop. He's yeah, not so a gendarme. Yeah, so you would recognize But the... he's seen... Gendarme reports, yes. and apparently they have a certain style. Yes. And reading the letter, he says, that guy is a gendarme. It has to be a mm. gendarme. Yeah. So could it be that the killer is a gendarme? That's never happened before. Mm. So he shows this to, to his wife at home, and she tells him, yeah, that's a gendarme. That's the gendarme writing. So they're both totally convinced mm-hmm. that it's the gendarme who wrote the letter. So he goes to his boss, who also then reads the letter. That's the one who circulated it, but yes. didn't connect the dots. And he says, oh yeah, that does sound like a gendarme yeah. describing things. Wow. Unfortunately, they're both quite low in the hierarchy. <sighs> so they find it very difficult to communicate their findings to anyone within the police. But 
outside the police is even more worse. It's impossible. Mm. So he writes to the regional police chief directly in a confidential, confidential memo. And he advises that he thinks that it would be a good idea to start an internal inquiry in the local police and the gendarmerie mm -hmm. to try to find out if this is indeed somebody they knew. Yeah, start looking at the uh, handwritten reports. Yes. Mm. The answer comes back, and it is that his evidence is uncertain, and such inquiry would be unwelcome. This is totally sounding like a six-part police drama at the moment. Yes. <laughs> so Nouveau can't do any more, so he drops the case. Oh, no, that's... There's nothing see, he can do. No, if... if he if, tried. Yeah, but if, if this was... He would now be creating his own murder board at home and working on it at home. Come on. On his free time, yeah. But no. The Renault 12 thief also stole some checks. Checks. Checks, okay. Mm -hmm. he, and he used them. He used 21 of them. So the police interrogates all the shop owners that have received those checks. Mm -hmm. And all of them, without exception, said that they never asked for an ID. Because the guy looked totally honest. They looked at him and it was very pleasant, very friendly. They never asked for an ID. So he obviously didn't have his gendarme uniform on at the time. No, 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 he was civilian. They did mention, many of them mentioned that he looked military. Right. Or? And gendarmes are military. Yes, that's true, yes. Yeah, so. They're not a civilian force, they are military. Mm. Can't be a coincidence. No. The analysis of the gun that to use to, to shoot um, Karin shows that they come from a 9mm short Beretta. Is that the guns that the uh, gendarme used? Well, by? there are two groups of people who are interested in that gun, collectors uh -huh. and the army. Okay. Uh -huh. Again, the army comes up. Mm. Unfortunately, for three months, nothing happens. Right. Not a crime they can link to the fire before or the Renault 12. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the case is dying at right. that point. On the 16th of November 1978, things change. A man driving a Peugeot 504, again, but that's just every other car at the time, mm -hmm. swerves and hit a woman on a bicycle. She's projected to the pavement, and when she gets up and screams, the 504 disappears. The car is found at a, train, a local train station on the 18th of November. The gendarmes opened the door, and boom, it was booby-trapped again. I was going to say, how, how are they going to get that this is connected? Okay, right, so... So clearly they found another car, third mm -hmm. car in that story. Yes. The inquiry this time is given to the police, but the gendarmes are really pissed off now, because they're the ones that are the victims, because yeah. there's two gendarmes that have been injured by a booby-trapped mm. car, and in both cases, the case goes to the police. So they decide to start their own inquiry. Mm. On the down low, because it's not official. Yeah. It's Captain Pinot that runs the search, and his nickname is Colombo. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got May Gray and Colombo. Yeah. Telling you, it is. It's like a, a police drama we're doing this week. Yeah. Pinot doesn't have access to all the information the police has, obviously, because the relationship between police and gendarmerie has never been friendly. Right. So they don't talk to each other. They're too. You would think that they're police for uh, kind yeah, of they police forces together. and they work to the to the Common same aim. Yes. No, 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 no. They're, they're totally separate and they just don't like each other. Mm. And it's still the case. The gendarmerie still doesn't talk much to the police and vice versa. That's just the way it is. He gets interested in a hold up in a local police uh, in a local post office. Right. What intrigues him in that case is that the gangster escaped in a car that had been stolen because the keys have been left on the ignition again. Like the previous 504, yeah. like the previous 112. Can it be a coincidence? Hmm. The police is also interested in that car, obviously, uh, because yes. they are the ones officially in charge of the inquiry. Mm -hmm. But they have one big advantage. They identified one fingerprint <laughs> that matches one find found on the first 504 right. and on the bullet casing in the Renault 12. So for them, they have a complete case with three cars. Right. And they have a, a, a hard link between all of them. The gendarmerie doesn't know any of that. Right. On the 1st of December 1978, a 19-year-old woman, Yolanda Radzewski. That's easy for you to say. It's Polish. It's R-A-S-Z-E-W-S-K-I. Yes. It has way too many consonants. Yeah. 
It is found behind the hippodrome in uh, Chantilly. Chantilly is a very famous hippodrome. It's mm-hmm. like Ascot. Yes. She has... I, I, th- I actually just thought you were just going to say hippo. I thought it was kind of strange to have It's horses, not yes. hippos. <laughs> yes, uh, of course. She has several 9mm Beretta bullet holes. Mm. Some straight to the heart. Right. So he was good to his word then. And the police remembers that letter mm-hmm. that said, next time I'll aim for the heart. Yeah. So it looks like it's, again, related to mm-hmm. that case. She's not dead when she's found. Right. She has time to tell what happened to her. She mm. describes that she had been picked up when she was hitchhiking by a young, good-looking guy. The spell-shaking replaced good-looking by Google-looking. <laughs> <laughs> At first, he was very chatty and nice. Right. But when they got into town, he got angry, and he told her that he was going to hurt her. No. And he did. Yeah. Uh, at some point, they got behind the hippodrome, turned to her, and shot her. And that was it. Okay. Several times. Again, the car had been stolen because the owner had left the keys on the oh ignition. Oh, God. But they, they're pretty sure it's the same guy again. Unfortunately, she dies later on that day in, in hospital. Oh. So we now have two murders. In total, it's seven, 17 crimes right. that they're investigating. As a result, finally, the police and the gendarmerie agreed to share information. Yeah. On just, that case only, uh, but they agreed to share information. Oh, just on that one case? Oh, come yeah. on. So Captain Pinot from mm-hmm. the gendarmerie finally has access to all the documents that the police had, mm-hmm. including the anonymous letter, which he had never seen yet. Do you think he has a uh, crumpled uh, raincoat? Probably, yes. Like Colombo. Yes. He reads it closely, and he comes to exactly the same conclusion, conclusion as Neveu four months earlier. Mm, that that d- smells of gendarme. Yeah. And he knows he's one. Yes. Takes one to know one. Yep. So when he mentions his suspicion to his hierarchy, mm-hmm. and should suggest that comparing fingerprints to, of all the local gendarmes yeah. would solve the affair, they refuse. Oh, for God's sake. So he wasn't even firing up up the food chain. Yeah. So he falls back on the suggesting to check all the gendarmes, the local gendarmes' timetables to see if they can find a pattern. Right. The hierarchy agrees. Right. But the directive is moderately followed because the gendarmes are not too happy to investigate themselves. So no. they don't actually do it. No, no. Yeah. So it was a good idea, but it didn't come to, to anything again. On the 29th of December, a driver sees just in front of him Something for of a green 504. That's the third or fourth 504 in the story. I know, it's the third one. They're all yeah. different, but it's another 504. Mm. It's Andre, a 19 year old hitchhiker, a woman, Andre with a knee. He sees her coming out of the car. He, the moving he, he car. sees a car in front of him when he's driving, so he's right. on the road, yeah, and yeah. something falls off the car. And it's her. As they're driving. And it's her, yes. Oh she had been shot three times. She survives. And she helps the police create a photo of it. Unfortunately, she's paralyzed for the rest of her life. Oh, God. At about 2 p.m., uh-huh. the 504 is spotted getting close to a gendarmerie roadblock. So, so mm-hmm. they are getting close. Yeah, yeah. The net's slowly, slowly yeah. getting there. Instead of showing, uh, slowing down, though, like it's supposed to, it, it picks up speed, up. Uh-huh. forces its way through the roadblock, and flees. The gendarme go into pursuit. In their shiny new SMV6. <laughs> the SM was the Citroën car with the Maserati engine. Okay. Fast. The though. gendarmerie had a few at the time. Yeah, it was fairly fast. It was breaking down all the time, but it was fairly fast. And that's why it was a flop, because mm. the, the Maserati engine was garbage. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was good to go in, uh, in a straight line fast, yeah. but then it would break down. Mm. And the parts were very hard to find because it was Italian parts I was instead say. of French parts. So Italian it was a complete engine. Fault. I think they even at the end of the life of the car, which wasn't very long, they replaced the engine by a Citroen engine. Mm. But it was too late. The car it had a bad reputation. It's like the, the Lancia Beta, same thing. You don't buy an Italian car for their uh, reliability. No, no, clearly, especially not in the 70s. No. So they keep up with no problem. Mm. But as they get to close to a railway crossing, the 504 crosses a hair before the train arrives. So the cops, the gendarmes stop because they don't want to hit the, the train. And by the train is gone, by the time the train is gone, the other car is gone and they don't think for a second that they'll find it. Yeah. So the girls continue, but at that point they don't know where to go. Telling you, that would be the end of episode five. 
of yeah. this police crime drama. Come on. They find the car. Right. In a swamp. It's stuck in the mud. Okay. It's empty, obviously. So they start searching the swamps. Mm-hmm. So they organize a massive swear- search with... What, a- for more cars? No, for a guy, for whoever was in the car. Okay. Because well, they think it, he's it was only a short amount. Why well, was only a short amount of time since it was forcing the roadblock? Well, it's true. So yeah. he can't be very far on foot. So they have a hundred cops or so, and they search the swamp, and they can't find him. Grid searching. Yeah. As as they do. Didn't work. They then then receive a second letter. And it says that its author has nothing to lose. He'll continue killing girls. And he's going to do it from now on by making their heads explode. Oh my god. And if he manages to keep a body, he'll cut it into pieces and drop them in various cities. I'm sorry, but the police and the gendarmes have to get their shit together and get this guy caught. Yeah. The letter also mentions that the author lost his wife in a car accident and has been to war in Africa. Oh my god, surely this must actually be able to let them know who he is. Yes, except that the police discovers later this entirely bullshit is <sighs> to lead them down blind, al- blind alleys. Of and course he was. Waste their of time. Course. None of that is true. Of course. Stupid Melanie. The murderer gets cocky, obviously, as they usually do. Yes. Because he got away with murder a few times. Mm-hmm. Nothing happened. They yep. kind of got close, but it was him re- being unlucky. So yeah, yeah. They, they get, get sloppier and sloppier. He gets overconfident. Where would police inquiries be without... Mm. Uh, Bad guys making mistakes. He steals another car. This time it's the ex-transport minister's car. Well, that's ballsy. And guess what? He had left the cars, on, the keys on the ignition. Oh, for Christ. It's a 70s issue, clearly. <laughs> People were just doing that. I don't remember it. I don't remember it. My, my, I know my parents leave their keys on the car in the garage. Yeah, well, yeah, that's, but not but that's behind a closed I gun. don't remember in the 70s, if in the 70s they left their cars on the ignition. Mm-hmm. I have no idea. I can't remember. I was too young, but... Uh, let's clear the 70s thing. Mm. So it's a fast car, so he decides to take it for a joyride on the N10. Mm. Unfortunately, he overdo- overdoes it a bit, and the distribution belt snaps. The car stops instantly, obviously, yep. on the side of the road. Not far behind him, two CRS motorcyclists. CRS are the crowd control forces from the gendarmerie. Right. Uh, CRS is Compagnie Républicaine de Sécurité. They're not like the chips. Well, they, they are the ones who used to have the motorbikes and still do. Mm. Uh, they're the only ones having motorbikes, really, right. uh, still. They're happy to help because they're nice guys. Oh, uh, yeah. They check the car and they discover that it's the next minister's car. Uh-huh. But the guy who is driving the car pretends to be his son. And they buy it. So, yeah, okay, we'll help you. So they call a tow truck for him. And they even get him to the the nearest garage for repairs. And then they think maybe we should really try. We should really try finding out who he is, just yeah. in case. But the time they think that he's gone, he escapes through a window. Telling you, I'm writing this this up totally. But on the plus side, they had a good look at him because oh. he was with them for a long time. Okay. So, so they can good... create a very good photo fit yes. at that point. And it's circulated in the local police force and mm. gendarmerie. And a colleague of Pino, the gendarme, yep. recognizes him instantly. And Colombo's on it's, the case. It's Lamar. They know who it is now. Good. He's a 22-year-old gendarme. Bukum Danu. Yeah, who worked with the guy who recognized him until last year. Mm-hmm. So he knows him very well. But since then, he had been moved to the Chantilly force. Right. So not far. They contact the gendarmerie um, in, Jean- in Chantilly, and they just can't believe it. Lamar is a good case solver. In fact, he's the one who find, found all the abandoned cars in this case. Oh, that's a coincidence. And, yeah, he's the one who worked like, tirelessly on trying to solve that case and mm. all these murders. It can't be him. No. Apparently, it's not obvious for gendarmes that in the 70s that the guy who finds all the abandoned cars in one case somehow is involved in the case mm. for them no it's not it's not that but today it would be obvious they would think well, yes. how can that guy find all those cars all over the yeah. place and no one else finds any of those cars yep 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 it's like the uh, the firemen being the arsonists yes yep and being the first on the on location yep. yeah that's exactly that so they don't believe it's it's him mm. it can't be 
Yeah, but you go where the evidence takes you, not... To... But they have a small doubt. So they check his timetable. And they discover that at every time there was an attack, he was off. Mm. Either on leave or on r and or, or on holiday. Day, yeah. He was always away from the, the mm-hmm. station, not at work, when these things happen. So they start suspecting a little bit that something's happening there. So always, always off. Uh, when the crimes were being committed and then just coming on to work when it was time to find the cars again. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. So they check his current situation and they discover he's out, he's out on patrol. So they want him back to arrest him quietly. Yep. They don't want the general public to know that the gendarme was a murderer <laughs> because it wouldn't be good for the reputation One of, the road, of the gendarmerie. No, bad reputation. Yeah. So they decide to trick him. They recall all the patrols Mm-hmm. under the pretense of a theft that needs to be urgently solved. Right. So they all come back one by one, and within about 15 minutes or so, Lamar comes in mm-hmm. with his car. But the gendarmes are a bit worried, because on that day, he had insisting, insisted on taking a small armory with him. Uh-oh. He had guns and machine guns with him. Oh, holy crap. He was told at the time that it's totally overkill for a patrol. Yes. But he insisted, I need those, I want those, and they gave it. And give them to him. Oh, well, that, so that they know he has an arsenal in the car. Oh, that's crazy. God, imagine what he would have done. He sounds like he was escalating. He probably was smelling something. Yes. So he wanted to be ready. Yep. So they expect a guy armed to the teeth to come out of the car and they don't want a bloodbath. So his boss goes to him and says, Lamar, are you going to war or something? You had the station. You don't need all that. Give it to me. And he gives him his machine gun. Because at the time, he came out of the car wearing a machine gun with it, on him. So it's not like it was in the boot, like in, uh, in the rookie. Mm-hmm. He was actually holding it in yeah. the car and uh-huh. then came out of the car still holding it. And he does. He gives it to his, to his boss because he doesn't know yet that they know something. So mm-hmm. he doesn't want to make too much noise. So he gives it to him. And he puts his hand in his pocket. They know he checked out lots more guns on that day. Right. So they're pretty sure he has a gun in his pocket. But before he can do anything, several of them jump on him and pin him to the ground. Right. He doesn't have time to get his hand out of his pocket. Phew. Then they arrest him. They mm-hmm. put cuffs on him. They fingerprint him. And because they don't believe it's him, it's, it's him. They check. They just want to double check. They yeah. want to show that the prints don't match. They do. Well, who was surprised other than them? Yeah, exactly. But to avoid selling the gendarmerie's honor, a resignation letter had been prepared for him <laughs> and they tell him to sign it. Oh, yeah. So that they don't arrest a gendarme, they arrest a next gendarme. Oh, come but he does, on. he signs it. Once arrested, they search his flat and they first search the living room, then the kitchen. There's just nothing out of place. Everything is immaculate. Everything is in this place. It's just, you can tell it's a gendarme's flat. It's essentially a, yeah. like a, his a bunks in the, in the yes. army. That's all perfect, all lined up. Yeah. You mm. can bounce a, bounce a coin off of his bed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nothing out of place. Then they search his bedroom. Again, nothing to find. Mm-hmm. It's all normal. And they eventually go to the guest bedroom, which was locked. Uh-oh. The only room that was locked. I'm frightened. They get in and they discover maps, guns, grenades, a military tent, autopsy photos on the wall. Holy crap. They can't believe their eyes. Mm. That's clearly a murderer's room. Mm. He's taken to the instruction judge Mm -hmm. and she asks him what he has to say for himself. And he starts talking. He talks for five hours. He goes over... All the crimes, all the murders, one after the other, in order, in minute detail. Wow. So he confesses to everything. And when the judge eventually asks him why he did it, his answer was, I'll stop here. And he never talked again. Really? Yeah. That's just wow. weird. Wow. Until that's he was curdling. asked why he did it, he was happy to talk. As that's soon as he was asked why, that's it. That's no, blood No talking curdling. anymore. Nothing because he's a psychopath. Well, there's a first psychological evaluation that's done and they found him legally responsible for his action. Mm -hmm. Just a bit schizophrenic. Just a bit schizophrenic. That. Mm -hmm. Then four other doctors look at him Mm -hmm. and they conclude in total three to two 
that he has two personalities and when he committed the crimes, he wasn't himself. Apparently, he has what they called hypoidophrenia or pseudopsychopathic schizophrenia. Okay. So it wasn't like DID, it wasn't disassociative. It's close disorder. to that. Um, yeah. I think it's something to... It's some kind of mix of egomania and schizophrenia or something. It's just... Wow. It, it apparently, it's extremely rare. Mm. But three out of five doctors agree that that's what he has. Okay. So he's not responsible for his actions. Okay. So he can't be brought to trial. Trial. So a judge decides in 1983. So it's a long time after. Yeah, because it goes on forever. Yeah. yeah. That he that no more legal action can be taken against him. Well, please say he's not out in. Uh, please say he's in a hospital, locked away somewhere. So instead of going to prison, he's sent to a psychiatric hospital. Right. And never comes out. In 2011... No. He was moved to a new one... Right. ...in his native uh, region. Right. And as far as we know, because it's not public record, he's still there. Oh, thank God for that. <laughs> but he's still alive. He's still alive. Well, yeah, I mean, that was in the 70s. I mean, he would have been quite young if he was... Uh, he was 22, okay. I think, at the time. Right. But he was being in his 60s be, now, mid-60s. Your parents' age. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Mm. A little bit younger, but barely. Yeah. In the end, the only sanction against anyone in in this story, in police or gendarmerie, mm -hmm. for the mess that this was, yeah. and the time it took to solve it yeah. when they had evidence everywhere, mm -hmm. was against a search dog who didn't find anything. So he retired the dog early. What the That's it. what... That's disgraceful. I have, oh, just a seething mass of air. Uh, that's disgusting. So the dog was a scapegoat and that was it. Oh, the dog was a scapegoat. Yeah. No, it was a dog. No, oh, well. Well, no time for my final words of wisdom, peep. I'm off to write my screenplay. <laughs>